Okay, well, thank you, Marcin, for the introduction. And um, I love this picture. This is, uh, so this is uh, a, a, a picture that was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, this incredible, stunning creation of modern science and technology that's been orbiting around the Earth for 20 years now, uh, taking these extraordinary photographs of the heavens. And this is a, uh, two galaxies, this is about 50 million light years away, so it took light 50 million years to get from here to, our, to the Earth. Uh, it's two galaxies that are in collision. And uh, so these are called the antenna galaxies because there are these big streamers right here that go off in both directions. It's two galaxies that have been colliding for about 300 million years and will continue to pass through and 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 complete their collision dance uh, for about another 400 million years. So uh, this thing has been going on, you know, for already for the whole length of time that, say, uh, mammals longer than the time that mammals have existed here on the Earth and been evolving and so forth. And each of those things in there has, you know, maybe a hundred billion stars. You know, so it's a comparable to the size of our own galaxy and so forth. Just an amazing thing. Kind of looks like a heart uh, if you look at it like that. And you'll see, I'll have a rotated version of it in a few minutes. Uh, if you rotate it in the right way, as was discovered by my wife, Christy, looks like a brain. And uh, in, in fact, on the cover of my book, thank you for mentioning that, because uh, this, this book is really a concise introduction to neuroscience for all intelligent readers, and I wrote it as a textbook for the class that I just finished teaching at UC Berkeley on Introduction to Neuroscience, which had 640 students in it. And it's meant to be a, a textbook that's comprehensive but fun to read. So it's only it's less than 300 pages, and it's you know really fun, and you learn something. Uh, so, uh, uh, but this this photograph's on the cover with a brain kind of over it. And the point is that I want to make this connection between um, uh, really the physics that describes the entire uh, nature of the universe in some way and the frontiers of where we are right now, I think, in the science of mind and consciousness and, and so forth. And I'll try to make some of that clear uh, uh, in a moment. So we're going to be talking about science, and when I say science, I mean that word very broadly defined. You know, the word science comes from the Latin root uh, to know. So it's really, from, for, I think most of us think that science is about understanding, uh, gaining knowledge and understanding about our world, just trying to figure things out, asking questions, <clears throat> doing experiments, getting information, and so forth. It doesn't necessarily presuppose some kind of uh, uh, assumptions on things as to how things uh, need to be uh, in some way, uh, although in, in practice that often does get put in there, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but in a very open-ended way, this is just trying to like, figure out what's going on. So there's a journal in science called Science. It's considered one of the <coughs> prestigious places to publish your experimental and theoretical results. And uh, it started way back in 1880. Uh, so in 2005, they celebrated their 125th anniversary. And as part of that celebration, they had a special issue where they had, uh, they uh, surveyed a whole bunch of you know, scientists and they came up with a list of 125 questions that they thought would be like the, the big questions. You know, what don't we know yet? Uh, here are 125 questions that uh, if we work on them, maybe in another 50 years or so, we can figure them out. So they were supposed to be kind of scientifically uh, tractable things, not questions that we could never hope to answer in some way. Um, and the first question on the list was, what is the universe made of? Uh, what the, and the way it was framed then was to describe, uh, you've all heard of things called like dark matter and dark energy, these mysterious uh, and mysterious in the sense that we don't know what they are. There's some kind of, there seems to be a lot of matter out there, like way more matter than the matter that we know about uh, that is not in any way interacting with our instruments. And so that's called dark matter. And then there also seems to be this energetic force that is accelerating the expansion of the universe. And that's called dark energy. And, but the, 
the idea would be that these are things that maybe if we keep doing our physics in another few decades, we might get some answer to that. But uh, I like to frame that question a little bit more broadly. And that is really, it's really asking kind of what's the nature of reality? I mean, what is the universe made of? What is this stuff that we think we call, you know, that we call reality? Like, what is going on with that? Uh, and the second question on their list was, what is the biological basis of consciousness? Uh, so, and again, the way they frame it in their one page write up here is, okay, how can we make sense of what we call our consciousness, our, our experience, our capacity to have experience, how can that be related to something going on in the brain? Not necessarily explain it completely in some way, but at least find brain processes that are measurable, that are kind of the necessary and sufficient conditions for consciousness in some way, or get some insight into that. But again, I like to kick it up a notch or two yeah. and make that a bigger question, like, okay, what is mind? What do we mean by that? What do we mean by consciousness? I loved what you said at the beginning around uh, consciousness being mode of access. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. I hadn't quite heard it you know, that way before. Uh, because mode of access is really the, it, it, this is how we engage with everything. I mean, all that we know comes to us by virtue of our capacity to have experience. That's all we have. This is the way we access everything. You know, we think we make some measurements with some instrument or something like that. Well, maybe there is an instrument doing stuff, and the, there are some numbers there and all of that, but the only way we know that is via our perception, which is part of our conscious awareness. awareness. So at, at some level, we're, that's the only way we have access to anything. So when I, when I use that term consciousness, I'm using it in that way. Um, it's our capacity to have an awareness uh, of everything, which is our mode of accessing everything. Mind is very, in the way that I'm defining it right now, is very closely related to that in that uh, I consider mind to be our collection of mental experiences. So that's our thoughts, our feelings, our perceptual experiences like colors and music and smells uh, and uh, our sense of self, which we construct out of all that. That would be our, our collection of mental experiences. Uh, mostly we're in touch with those mental experiences by being conscious of them. So they're kind of, there's a, very, there's a lot of overlap between how I'm defining consciousness here and how I'm defining mental experience. Mental experience can be a little larger in the sense you can have unconscious things going on that are still mental and affecting behavior, but they're out of our awareness and they can be brought into awareness. And that's kind of what you do in psychotherapy, for example, is bring things from the unconscious more into conscious awareness. So there's a relationship, and the uh, connection between consciousness or mind and the physiological processes in our brains and bodies uh, is usually referred to as the mind-body problem. That is, you know, how is the mind related to the physical processes in our brain and body? And that's the way that was framed in that science thing about the, what's the biological basis of, of consciousness. What's going on in our brain that is in some way intimately related to our capacity to have conscious experience. But really, this is a bigger question. Who are we? You know, <laughs> like who, are, who do we think we are you know, with our consciousness? And how are we related to everything else that we call reality or physical reality? Which is, again, very connected to what is reality, really. Because you know, all of our conceptions of reality are only via that mode of access of consciousness. So the topic of consciousness is huge. Uh, it's central to everything that we do. And uh, uh, as I think one of you guys pointed out at the beginning, uh, uh, a few dec not that long ago in science, you couldn't use that term even. Uh, it didn't, people didn't know how to relate to it. And it's only been in the last several decades that it's been sort of scientific, considered scientifically rigorous to even use the term consciousness, even though, of course, we're all conscious. It was somehow sort of considered somehow off the table for study, whereas that's not true anymore now. Okay, back there's the antenna galaxies. Here, here it is if you chop out that center part and then rotate it by 90 degrees. It looks kind of like a brain. Uh, so I want to use this as, again, <clears throat> because how we structure contemporary science and the history of contemporary science, 
uh, only goes back, say, 500 years. It kind of goes back to the time of Galileo, really. I mean, first Copernicus and the idea that the, the Earth was not the center of the solar system. Uh, and then people like Kepler and Galileo putting more of a quantitative frame on that. Isaac Newton coming along and <clears throat> turning it into a real highly structured mathematical formalism. Uh, and then uh, what's come since then. So, so our contemporary science is grounded in physics and astronomy, really. Uh, and everything else has been derived from that in our contemporary worldview of, of uh, physical science. Uh, and so the physics is somehow taken to be kind of the fundamental thing, you know, the thing that describes everything. Uh, chemistry, uh, which talks about the construction of matter and how chemical elements interact to make larger su structures and so forth, is is considered to be sort of still underlain by the f by the f by the foundational principles of physics that you know many folks have said you know all of chemistry can be reduced uh, simply to the Schrodinger equation or you know the, the fundamental uh, properties of of, uh, of quantum physics. Biology then, in contemporary science, is believed to be derivative of chemistry in some way, that certain sorts of chemical systems uh, are structured in such a way as to develop a stability where they can utilize energy, ultimately from the sun, locally, uh, to maintain their stability in the, in the force, in the uh, presence of entropy that would cause things to fall apart, uh, and that they, may, that they can store information that can be used to uh, replicate and so forth. So somehow that, these, conf these special configurations of molecules are what gives rise to life. And there's, in contemporary mainstream science, there's no room for anything else there. I mean, it used to be, you know, 100 years ago, uh, it was much more popular to, <clears throat> uh, for many scientists to believe that there was still a kind of mysterious vitalism, some kind of vital essence that had to be there to also, that was different from just uh, uh, atoms and molecules and conventional energies, electromagnetic energies, uh, that would be needed to animate the system. But that's no longer considered to be a credible, even though we don't know. I mean, nobody knows how to create a living organism in a lab yet. There are people working on it. Uh, and there's a, there's a belief among some folks that that problem will be solved in another you know, 15 years or something like that. But nobody's done it yet. Nobody's been able to take an, a bunch of inanimate stuff and then animate it in some way. So, but right now, biology is assumed to be derivative of physics and chemistry. And then neuroscience is plopped on top of that. You know, neuroscience has evolved in the last uh, few decades. I mean, that term only came into existence maybe 50 years ago. Uh, and um, is believed to be kind of a special case of biology, where you have nervous systems and ultimately brains and so forth. And then plopped on top of that, we have mind, because this is the standard, uh, you might call this perspective here reductionism, where we try to explain more uh, complicated systems in terms of more uh, fundamental pieces in some way. So the fundamental pieces here would be the fundamental particles of physics. Uh, and the forces that hold them together, and then that leads to chemistry, biology, neuroscience, and mind, even though it seems to be kind of different because it is a kind of intrinsically and irreducibly first-person subjective. The standard working assumption in contemporary mainstream science is that, well, it's going to fit into this hierarchy, too. It's just, we just haven't figured it out yet. That's why it's number two on that list of problems, you know, but we will eventually figure it out by doing more of this. And you know, all of this together really uh, uh, can be termed, <clears throat> it often goes by the term physicalism or physical materialism. Uh, physicalism is a term that's used in philosophy of mind to describe a, a worldview really, a metaphysical worldview that assumes that everything, all of reality, all of experience, everything that we could possibly know uh, is explainable in terms of the physical properties of matter and energy. Uh, and, uh, and it's important to appreciate that is a worldview. Uh, that's where I make the distinction between you know, science broadly defined where like, we don't know what's going on. We're just trying to find out. And science a little bit more narrowly defined, or maybe quite a bit more narrow, narrowly, uh, narrowly defined, which is the way it's usually done, which is within this worldview. 
So if you come along and say, well, I'm not so sure. Maybe there does need to be some chi or some vital force or some you know, prana that's in there in addition to that, that would that you would you would be kicked out of the room, you know, in most uh, scientific conferences. They'd say, you know, go to the yoga conference down the street. You know, you're not a scientist. Well, you might well be a scientist. You're just broadening your worldview a little bit. Okay. I want to say one thing about physics because because physics has been all about trying to understand the fundamental fabric of the universe in some way and really the nature of reality in some way, at least for the last, uh, you know, there's Newton and Galileo and Einstein and Niels Bohr and Schrodinger and uh, uh, many of these folks, especially in the 20th century, people like Bohr and Einstein and Schrodinger and Heisenberg and uh, they, they, they started, you know, talking philosophically about the nature of reality in ways that were very interesting. But none of those guys, if you read what they wrote, were, had the kind of arrogance to think that we've got it almost all figured out. You know? So it was very interesting. But that's shifted. You know, the contemporary physics folks that are writing you know, some of the popular stuff seem to have a lot more hubris in, in saying, like, we're almost there. You know, we got this stuff so figured out now that we can say this. And it's just bizarre to me. You know, like here's, here's Stephen, Stephen Hawking's book, The Grand Design. <clears throat> here's the last paragraph. The fact that we human beings, who are ourselves mere collections of fundamental particles of nature, have been able to come this close to an understanding of the laws governing us in our universe is a great triumph if the theory is to be confirmed by observation. He was talking about 11-dimensional string theory here, which still hasn't been. If the theory is to be confirmed by observation, it will be the successful conclusion of a Search going back more than 3,000 years, we have, will have found the grand design. And then this book just came out like last week, probably will become a bestseller. Uh, Sean Carroll, who's a, a very competent theoretical physicist from, from Caltech. So in, in the book, there's this equation, uh, which is like the almost uh, fundamental equation for almost everything or something like that. Uh, and uh, uh, Right now, we have a certain theory of particles and forces, the core theory that seems indisputably accurate within a wide domain of applicability, includes everything going on within you and me and everything you see around you. It will continue to be accurate a thousand or million years from now. Whatever amazing discoveries will be made, you know, continue. But this is the, this is the one that gets me. Consciousness emerges from the collective behavior of particles and forces rather than being an intrinsic feature of the world. And there is no immaterial soul that could possibly survive the body. When we die, that's the end of us. Now, that may all be true, but it does not come from that equation. <laughs> there, there is no way, there is no way that anything that physics has discovered can make a statement like that. I mean, we do not know what's going on with life. We do not know what's going on with death. We do not know what happens after death except by assumption. And you can assume what you want or you can believe what you want and so forth. But don't tell me that the, somehow this has been proven, you know, that all of this stuff is ruled out by fundamental physics. And so I think this is a really important, because this book will become a bestseller probably. And uh, this is a really important thing to appreciate that we are, you know, in some kind of weird way imposing these limits of what we're able even to willing to consider thinking about when it comes to study and consciousness and the mind and who we are and so forth. And I think that's a grave mistake if we really want to stay open to how mysterious all this stuff is and how innovative we're going to need to be to sort of get to the next step of appreciation. Okay, so how can we go about doing this with our contemporary uh, brain science stuff? How do we investigate this mind-body relationship. First of all, it's clear that our consciousness is dependent upon our bodies and our brains. I mean, these are our vehicles that we have for connecting to accessing. Uh, and uh, if you damage especially the brain, uh, you get very you know, clear various kinds of impairments in, in consciousness. Your, your thoughts, your feelings, your capacities to perceive and, and so forth are all uh, can change in very well-defined ways by damaging different parts of the brain. 
uh, so or, or by putting certain chemicals in there. You know, if you put certain psychoactive chemicals into the body or into the brain, that changes your consciousness. You know, alcohol or caffeine or LSD or Prozac, whatever it is, it can have effects on your feelings and your thoughts and your, and your perceptions. So how do we go about studying this? Well, one is through physically studying the brain, you know, using the, all the tools and techniques of cellular and molecular biology to uh, figure out as much as possible how the brain is operating. The brain is really complex. Human brains are really complex. Brains in general are really complex, but uh, uh, human brains are up there, you know, with the, the, there's a small number of animals, humans, whales, uh, dolphins, elephants, all, all of, uh, all of uh, those animals have very complex brains. Our brain has about 100 billion nerve cells, neurons, and at least 100 billion or maybe 200 billion or you know, some order of magnitude like that of another kind of cell called a glial cell. Uh, and these cells are, are all connected together in very elaborate ways. These are drawings from uh, Ramon y Cajal and Golgi, who were two European uh, anatomists back at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and they did the most exquisite drawings of neurons you know, that have ever been done. I mean, even more than 100 years later, nobody's surpassed uh, their artistic uh, sophistication when it came to depicting these things. And the reason they were able to do this is that so they spent you know, thousands of hours you know, slicing up brains and looking at them under microscopes and drawing what they saw. And they, uh, the reason they were able to do such things as this uh, is Golgi, back in the 1870s, Golgi was a physician whose uh, day job was overseeing an asylum in Italy that had 600 and some patients in it. And in his spare time, he was interested in, in the anatomy of the brain, and he figured out how to make a stain uh, that colored the, the neurons black, essentially he called it the black reaction in, in Italian. Uh, and um, the beautiful thing about Golgi's stain is that it stains all the little dendrites and axons and all the intricate parts of the neuron. Uh, but uh, the other very interesting thing about it is that it's really inefficient and it only stains about 1% of the neurons in the brain. Uh, so you get all these, you get these beautiful neurons that are just kind of stand out. But in fact, you know, the complexity of the brain is much more densely packed. Now these are Golgi stained things here. Uh, so these are neurons that are hooked together. You know, there's maybe 10 neurons or 15 neurons in this picture here. And typically this is what we see when we see pictures of the brain. So all these neurons are hooked together like that. Uh, and the synapses, these connections between neurons are of two different types. Uh, there's something called an electrical synapse. Uh, so this is meant to be the boundary layer of a nerve cell. For those of you that know some cell biology, that's a phospholipid bilayer of membrane. And then there's a multi-subunit uh, protein in here uh, called a connexon. And the connexons can couple together in two adjacent cells and form a channel. And this is called an electrical synapse, and charged particles and other small molecules sometimes can pass through that channel so that there's a direct linkage or communication between cells. And there are trillions of these things between our 100 billion neurons and our 100 billion plus glial cells. There are trillions and trillions and trillions of these electrical synapses connecting things together. So there's an enormous complexity. In addition to that, there's another kind of synapse called a chemical synapse, which is more famously discussed, which shows the uh, end of an axon from one neuron and the beginning of a, say, dendrite here on another neuron. And there's all these you know, neurotransmitters here that are being released, and there are receptors here. And there's all kinds of interactions that can go on and all kinds of dynamic change that can happen. So, and this is going on at trillions and trillions and trillions of locations between all these cells in our brain. So there are a couple hundred billion cells connected together with probably a couple hundred trillion synaptic connections. So this is staggering complexity. Just the idea that we're going to somehow be able to map all this and then reproduce it all on a computer chip in 10 years, and you can upload your memory into it, is just baloney. It's just not going to happen like that. It's really, really complicated. Um, and uh, this is an elect, just to give a little reality to that, if you take that 
and you actually take a real electron microscope picture. So here's the end of an axon here. These, are, these little spheres are synaptic vesicles. This is a dendrite. Uh, and this little space here between this neuron and this neuron is about 20 billionths of a meter, 20 nanometers. So that's way too small to see with any kind of anything other than an electron microscope. And then many of you have heard the term neuroplasticity, or uh, and and plasticity means the ability of a of the nervous system to dynamically change its own wiring, which is happening all the time. Uh, and it, for an example, as an example here of one way that that kind of plasticity has been mapped at the synaptic level, you can, you can highlight things like this. So you can get changes in how long certain kinds of channels that stay, stay open that can result in more neurotransmitter or less neurotransmitter release. You can have more receptors or fewer receptors. Uh, and all of that will change the strength of the synapse. There's a whole new way of signaling that's been discovered in the last 20 years in the brain called retrograde signaling, which is the, uh, the release of neurotransmitters over here that can go back to the, the presynaptic axon and affect the properties of that axon. So all of this stuff is happening all the time. So my, my take home message with all of this is that brains are really, really complex. And there, and there is a lot happening. Uh, within our brains all the time, uh, uh, trillions of synapses. I mean, and your brain is active 24 hours a day. It doesn't get any less active when we sleep. It just changes in its pattern of activity, as as uh, as we saw in the in the previous slides with the uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Mendelssohn, you know, showing the different kinds of electrical activity during different stages of sleep. But it's way active all the time. And your brains are way active all the time, no matter what you're doing. If you're thinking really hard, it's, it's an insignificant amount of additional activity that goes in your brain. If you're sitting quietly in a dark room with no sound, and you measure the overall uh, energy consumption by the brain, it's going to be huge. And then if you turn on the lights and make a lot of noise and, and ask you to like sing a song or something like that and measure the energy utilization of the brain under the goes up like 3%. You know, so our brain is active all the time and dynamically changing all the time. So it always, it's a little amusing to me always when, when, when folks try to simplify uh, complex human behaviors to you know, one neurotransmitter. Like, oh, you know, you're, you're suffering from depression. You have a deficit in serotonin. You need to have an adjustment in your serotonin, and then you'll be better. I mean, that, it's way more complex than that. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, that sells pills because you can kind of condense that into one flashy little advertisement. But it's not what's, nothing is so simple in, uh, in brain systems. OK, so like for example here, here's our typical Golgi stained collection of neurons. Uh, and it only looks simple like that because remember, the Golgi stain is only staining 1% of the cells. But if you actually do an electron microscope slice through the human cerebral cortex and look at that, you get something that looks a lot more like that, which is what's given the name cortical neural pill. This is densely packed. There are no spaces here. Uh, so if you slice into a piece of neural tissue in the brain, it is it's like spaghetti that has been compressed together like into a one big blob. Uh, everything is touching everything else. Everything is interacting with everything else at some level. Yes, there are these local synaptic connections where there are neurotransmitters and electrical synapses. But each one of those cells is also creating an electromagnetic field around it because of all the moving charges. And that electromagnetic field is affecting the activity of all the other cells around it. And so you get these uh, unfathomably complex electrodynamic couplings between everything in the brain which makes it very difficult to figure out what's going on. I mean, in principle, we can understand that. But in practice, we can't really describe it. What we can do, though, is measure the overall electrical activity of the brain, which is what the EEG does, or the electroencephalograph that, that Dr. Mendelssohn showed some figures of. So uh, this is a recording from my brain, I think. but. Uh, of a, of a bunch of different channels uh, uh, in an EEG, EEG recording. Uh, and, and so one method of trying to understand what's going on in the brain by our normal tools of biophysical science 
is to try to understand where this is coming from, where this electrical activity is coming from, how it's generated by these, by these millions and billions of neurons that are all doing their thing uh, simultaneously. Okay, so what are our current approaches then in trying to investigate consciousness using the tools of contemporary science? Well, brain lesions is something that's been used for a couple hundred years now. That is, you note uh, somebody has a stroke or a tumor or a traumatic injury of some kind and they damage a certain part of the brain. How does that impact their behavior, their thinking, their feeling? their capacity to be aware or unaware and so forth. And for 200 years or so, you know, clinical neurology has been compiling a sort of database of how different areas of the brain are involved in perception and awareness and so forth uh, as a result of these kind of connections between brain lesions and behavior. Now that's uh, taken another level of, kind of sophistication in the last several decades because of the development of really sophisticated brain imaging technology like PET scans and functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, EEG and MEG, which are much more high resolution, magnetic encephalogram and electroencephalogram. And so to, to make connections between regions of the brain that are active and patterns of activity in, in the brain and different kinds of behavior uh, is, is a big area of, uh, of, uh, of study in contemporary neuroscience trying to dissect sensory pathways. We know that we get all of our information about the world. You know, everything that we know is coming through our capacity to make sense of our environment in some way. Uh, so by trying to understand, you're like, okay, well, how does the visual system work? How are we actually creating the world that we see uh, through the visual input to our eyes? You know, how are we creating the world that we hear through the auditory system? So that's another huge area of study in, in uh, consciousness research. Pharmacology. If you put certain chemicals into the body or into the brain, how does that affect behavior? And so trying to understand the patterns of, uh, of activity in different kinds of psychoactive substances. You know, how does alcohol work? How does cannabis work? How does uh, caffeine work? And so forth is additional information about uh, about how brain physiology is connected with consciousness. Uh, one of the real catalytic events in the history of modern neuroscience was, you know, very few people appreciate this connection really, was the discovery of LSD and LSD's effects by Albert Hoffman in 1943. Uh, because what Hoffman discovered, you know, accidentally, you know, although it may have been guided by some you know, intuition that, that he he honored. Now, Hoffman just, pardon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hoffman just died about uh, eight years ago. He was 103 almost. Yeah. Um, and and, uh, and <clears throat> in, um, was that he discovered this chemical that nothing of that kind of potency had been known up to then. So the idea that you could take a few micrograms, a few millionths of a gram of a substance, and put it inside the body, and then some even smaller amount of that got into the brain, and had this profound effect on thoughts and feelings and perceptions and so forth was completely unprecedented. And it, what, it, what it catalyzed then was the idea that, well, there's something really chemical going on here in the brain. And there's some like really profound connection between brain chemistry and experience, consciousness and perception and and mind, uh, and that's that was a new idea. I mean, pr pretty much nothing was known about nervous system chemistry in 1943. <coughs> Serotonin hadn't been discovered. Uh, you know, glutamate, GABA, all these neurotransmitters, and none of them had been discovered. We knew about acetylcholine mostly from the autonomic nervous system. Uh, so <clears throat> the uh, and uh, uh, so this was a this really was a turning point for the whole field of sort of biological psychiatry and and what eventually became neuroscience is that we could maybe study the brain or learn things about the brain-mind connection through chemicals. And then finally, you know, there are a few people that are actually interested in trying to look at other animals and try to figure out ways that you might be able to uh, assess something about what that animal's experience was uh, and or wh whether they might have some kind of awareness uh, uh, and the best way that has been d used 
or really one common way that has been used is the idea of can an animal recognize itself in a mirror as being uh, it, as being uh, it, that very animal. So you put some mark on the animal and then you see whether that animal can figure out that that mark is actually on them you know, by looking in the mirror. And there's not that many animals that have been shown to do that. Elephants, dolphins, uh, the, great, the great apes and orangutans, gorillas, uh, chimpanzees and so forth. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, the magpie, a bird, uh, was also found to do that. So, you know, it's, it seems pretty primitive, but it's kind of the best idea folks have come up with so far. One of the big focuses on current approaches to uh, neuroscientific investigation of consciousness is what's called the neural correlate of consciousness, or NCC. You know, what is it that can be measured in the brain that seems to be a necessary condition to have happening in terms of brain activity that is correlated with conscious experience, awareness, uh, being, being uh, uh, knowing what's going on versus not knowing what's going on and so forth. And, uh, uh, and that has been elusive. You know, there have been, there are various theories that are, and these are all just theories. <laughs> You know, one theory is that, well, there's something about the synchronous activity at high frequency, 40 hertz or more in the EEG that's connecting together various areas of the brain and might be necessary to kind of pull the sensory stimuli together to, you know, form some kind of conscious experience of it. Now, note that this does not explain the awareness in any way, that this is just a correlate of the awareness that might be in some way uh, predictive because you know one of the interesting questions is if somebody's in a coma or some kind of vegetative state and so forth where they are completely unreactive unresponsive to any kind of attempt to uh, communicate with them uh, are they still aware uh, and uh, that's an unanswered question and, and there was a very interesting series of, exp of uh, uh, a study that was done a few years ago just a very few years ago published in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think, where they took people who were in these unresponsive states, uh, they put them in a fMRI, in a functional magnetic resonance imaging device, so they could measure uh, with high resolution their brain activity. Uh, and then they would tell them to do things like, they, they got somebody who used to play tennis when before they had their whatever their injury was that put them into this coma state. Um, they had them like, oh, they talked to them and they said, imagine being on a tennis court, imagine playing tennis and so forth. And they saw that brain activity in the parts of their motor systems in the frontal lobe was actually changing in a way that was consistent with them running around on a tennis court and swinging rackets and so forth. So that suggested that something was getting in. Uh, and whether that person had an awareness of, or this was somehow more, some more, more automatic thing, uh, we don't know. But it's a very, very interesting and relevant, even you know, ethically relevant uh, question. So how to measure that, we don't know. Uh, you know. I don't know where this will go in terms of a viable way. Another idea that's out there right now is called integrated information. That is that there's got to be a certain level of complexity of interaction between the neurons uh, before there's a, a conscious awareness associated with that, uh, and that that complex integration can be disabled by certain, you know, one of the people that came up with this idea, uh, Tononi, is an, anest is an anesthesiologist and, uh, and a sleep researcher. I'm not sure he's an anesthesiologist, but he's a sleep, re he's a sleep researcher, yes. He collaborates with anesthesiologists, uh, and... Uh, He's a psychiatrist and a sleep researcher at the University of Wisconsin and collaborates with anesthesia. And they, you know, they have this whole idea that general anesthesia disrupts this in a way that produces a loss of this integration uh, and so forth. Um, my current favorite uh, is that there's, a, uh, there's something going on in the, the complex electro electrodynamic activity that's measured in the EEG uh, that uh, is a, uh, that shifts in these kind of quantal ways at certain points that may be associated with moments of consciousness. And this idea is due to a, a colleague of mine who just died uh, a couple weeks ago at, the, at UC Berkeley, Walter Freeman uh, III, uh, who was 89 years old, uh, but still publishing papers every year. Uh, and uh, 
the idea that you might be able that, and he was one, he was really one of the founders of the modern uh, field in neuroscience called neurodynamics, which is a way to try to make sense of the the collective activity of hundreds of millions of neurons all doing their thing at once, you know, producing things like the EEG patterns and so forth. So again, this is these are very nascent ideas. Uh, Continued invest. Okay, this continued. Another way that this continued manifest uh, continued investigation is manifest is in these huge uh, multinational brain mapping projects. You know, like the Brain Connectome Project. You know, there's the European. If you go to the Human Brain Project of the European Union website, uh, they've got. You know, uh, the, and then there's the American Brain Initiative, but it's got a much more less glitzy website. But the EU project has a like a eight minute you know nicely produced slick video um, introducing the whole thing which is beautiful and it's an amazing collaboration between you know all of these institutions but the goal is basically to map you know all the cells and all the connections and all the functional circuitry uh, in the brain and some folks hope that within you know 15 20 years uh, we'll be able to build a little Maybe that's a little, but some kind of duplicate uh, uh, simulation of the human brain. Uh, and, I, you know, I don't think so, but maybe. And, but this will continue to go on and flourish, and that's great. And a lot of cool discoveries are going to come from these kinds of projects. They're really, really cool. However, uh, some of the other new territory would be to try to push the neurodynamic stuff of understanding not not simply the circuitry and all the individual synaptic connections, but to somehow try to get a better grip on the collective activity of all this stuff at once, which I think is going to be necessary. Uh, push the limits of really going into the interior of the cell, because I think there's still a thought that cells are kind of just bags of protoplasm. There's not a lot going on inside. There's the DNA and some mitochondria. That ain't the case. I mean, they are highly structured, almost crystalline systems that have a lot of order and a lot of potential for all kinds of interactions that may be absolutely essential to understanding life itself um, and mind eventually even. Uh, and we're only developing now the tools to actually probe down more and more deeply into those systems, uh, which include things like Various manifestations of quantum mechanical effects in these subcellular environments, neurodynamic. Okay, At the quantum measurement problem. Say again, you know, my goal in this talk, which I guess is almost over, uh, <laughs> is to give you a kind of uh, overview of this landscape uh, you know, of uh, uh, all these different approaches that are. Uh, being explored in really very the very beginning ways to try to understand uh, the the connection between what we call our conscious experience and the uh, rest of our physiology, and uh, and rest assured that we have not gone we have not gotten very far in any of this stuff, but it's now taken very seriously as a way to you know, continue to pursue this. Now. Uh, in terms of ways forward, though, I, I do want to mention a couple of other things. How much longer do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, five minutes. So I want to measure a couple of other, uh, mention a couple of other things. In William James, who's one of the founders, really, of the modern science of consciousness, really, in mind, you know, he wrote a book in 1890 called The Principles of Psychology. And he laid out, you know, among many things that he laid out in that book, which is an amazing you know, uh, book, uh, is, that, is that really to study the mind, which is what he, his interest was, was trying to understand the human mind. Um, we need to look at behavior, you know, kind of the psychology. We need to look at the neural correlates of behavior, you know, neuroscience. There wasn't any neuroscience then, but to the extent it was possible to try to figure out what was going on inside the physiology. And we also need to look directly at the mind itself, that is the actual mental phenomena itself, you know, to better understand the qualities of experience. And uh, so this was a very exciting thing at the time, uh, but uh, uh, right around the time that James died, uh, the kind of behaviorists sort of took over the field of uh, 
experimental psychology and and the mind was kind of put in the closet for another you know 50 years or so uh, so but this refined analysis of mental experience can really be pursued you know we're in a place to do that James pointed out in his book that in order to really look carefully at the mind uh, one needs to like keep one's attention focused and that's really hard uh, however there are tools around to do that that James was actually not aware of at the time, and that comes from the contemplative traditions around the world that have spent thousands of years, some of them, developing these really refined ways of studying mental phenomena directly. And so uh, Marchin mentioned in my introduction you know, that one of the things I've been involved with for the last few, since 2004, so for the last 12 years, uh, is in a program of teaching uh, brain science to Tibetan Buddhist monastics at monasteries in India. Uh, and uh, this stems from a program that the, that's the Dalai Lama up on the upper left when he was visiting UC Berkeley a few years ago. He's wearing a Cal Bears cap. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, um, this stems from a dialogue that the Dalai Lama created with contemporary scientists going back about 30 years, and then about 15 years ago, he said, well, you know, I can't be the only one that's talking about to the scientists, so we need to have more scientifically educated folks that are grounded in Buddhist philosophy also be part of this conversation, so we need to bring science education into the, into the curriculum for nuns and monks in these monasteries, and that was a really unprecedented thing that you know nobody kind of went for right away, but uh, they have gone for it now. Um, and so uh, here's some of the. This is one of my classes over there, <laughs> and uh, you know there they are studying the brain. <laughs> uh, I love this. This is why I'm introducing them to the, the blind spot. You know they're finding their blind spots. That's it. <laughs> So the, the idea is here uh, is that, uh, oops, let me go back to that. The, uh, there's several things going on here. I mean, one is that the, the Tibetan Buddhists have a, have a really long tradition of contemplative expertise. So they really know how to, uh, they have tools that are, that, uh, that are very helpful for focusing attention. And so that's a valuable thing for James's. Is, uh, quest of being able to get a better analysis of mental experience. The other thing I think is interesting about this is it's a productive way to engage with uh, between science and religion. You know, there's a lot of uh, kind of historical baggage around that conversation. You know, goes back to Galileo being you know the the target of the Inquisition for his defense of Copernican ideas and so forth. And then prominent people write books these days on how deluded you know, belief in God is and all of that stuff. And so this conversation that the Dalai Lama has, has uh, facilitated is one way to uh, engage in, with religious traditions in a way that can be productive and helpful. You know, I'm going to have to, let's see. OK, I really need to end with this, because this is uh, important. Um, OK, so I'm going to skip. OK. Let's do this. So uh, the final place I want to leave us with then is, first of all, we have no idea what's going on with, with mind. I mean, really. I mean, we have all these powerful tools uh, that are being applied to this right now in neuroscience, and that is great. Uh, and that will continue to flourish. And that's wonderful. And it's going to lead to all kinds of cool stuff. However, there are some real you know, issues. Of course, the physicalist perspective, as at least narrowly defined, the physicalist perspective assumes that whatever mind and consciousness are, it has to be reducible to uh, the physical properties of matter and energy. And, if it's, and, and the narrow definition of physicalism is that it's matter and energy as we currently understand it, even. That's why people like the, the uh, physicist that I quoted earlier who wrote the recent book says, this equation proves that consciousness is just, a, it's just the atoms and molecules in our brain, and there can't be anything that happens after the brain dies, and proven. You know, well, how is that proven? It's proven only if you assume that everything that is uh, true about our experience is somehow reducible to what we know right now, which would be quite remarkable. See, that's the hubris part. It's like at every point in the history of civilization, 
we always think we know more than what we actually know. And then you look back even 100 years later, wow, look at all this new stuff that we've discovered. Uh, and so why, would it, why is it going to be any different now? I mean, that's ridiculous to think that a thousand years from now, we're not going to know if somehow we make it to a thousand years from now. We're not going to know a lot more than what we know now. Come on. <laughs> so in any case, to entertain the possibility that whatever we call our consciousness can transcend or go beyond the physical body in some way is a scientifically valid hypothesis that can be investigated. And there are actually good, credible folks who are trying to investigate that. And the way they do it is they study things like people who have out-of-body experiences, when they have a near-death experience or something else that causes their, the, the way they report it, you know, their awareness to leave their body. They accurately report details that have been verified in some cases that they could not have seen if they weren't somehow able to observe from this distant place. And that's just inexplicable in terms of anything we know right now. So, I mean, there are two reactions to that. Either it's like, well, the person was just hallucinating and making it up and, and whatever, or it can't be studied or, you know, whatever. Or you can take it seriously as something that might be happening and try to figure out ways to study that. And there's a whole bunch of people, well, a small number of people that are trying, you know, hard to to explore that. Another thing is to look at, you know, when I talk with the, the Tibetan Buddhists over there, you know, I tell them all about synapses or whatever, and then they say, well, that's, that's great, but what about reincarnation? You know, how can we study that? And of course, most scientists would say, well, you know, that's just a belief you have. It, it's not true, <clears throat> uh, and the, it can't be studied. Well, sorry, it can't be. You know, so, and, and there are people who are trying to seriously pursue that, there are actually lots and lots of cases of small children who spontaneously talking, talk about being somebody else. And it can, be, it can be dismissed, which is what we would usually do, especially in our culture, or you can take it seriously and you know, kind of get more information and so forth. And, and so there are people who are trying to document that. And I have no, I, have, I don't know what's going on. I just think it's interesting that there are people who are trying to study these things. Uh, and then finally, Okay, okay, this is the last slide. <clears throat> so what are some of the states of consciousness that are possible entry points into this expanded way of investigation? And here are four. Uh, meditation is more than just relaxation to serious practitioners of it who have spent uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours uh, delving into this uh, non-ordinary state of consciousness. And there are claims uh, that they can access information in ways that are not available to ordinary perception, deserve to be looked into. Psychedelics is another one. You know, psychedelics are said by many people to open up realms of, the, uh, of consciousness uh, that may be revealing uh, of additional new kind of truths about, uh, about the mind-brain connection. Uh, shamanic states, I mean, there are, there are other practices besides psychoactive plants or mushrooms that can induce states of consciousness which may uh, connect folks to other realms of knowledge according to many other traditions. So this is all about taking knowledge from other traditions seriously rather than just dismissing them as scientifically ill-informed primitives who don't know any better, which is the con conventional mainstream way of looking at this. And finally, what you're going to hear about you know, after our break, um, dreams. And uh, how dreams may be more than just random activity of the, of the cortex during certain stages of sleep, even though that might be part of what's going on. Is it possible that there's more going on during the dream state than just that? Uh, some people think so. So with that, I'll leave you. Uh, and uh, oh, one more. Last quote of William James. So William James, in a book he wrote in 1895, said that he's talking about the future of mind research here, the, the new mind researchers when they come along. The best way in which we can facilitate their advent is to understand how great is the darkness in which we grope and never to forget that the natural science assumptions with which we started are provisional and revisable things. That is, like, you know, what we know now is not the final answer, despite what, you know, it may feel like. 
So thank you very much for your patience. And attention. <laughs> Okay, well, we, we've been given the blessing to ask for questions if you wish. More questions, less coffee. One or two. <laughs> One or two, yeah. So, with, uh, particularly the work with the, the Buddhist monks, is, are there people who are starting with the worldview assumption that consciousness is where everything begins, and then the physical stuff is the sort of the densest manifestation of where everything begins, consciousness, dreams, all that. Are there people doing that besides yes. dreams, dream researchers? Well, okay, so the, so the question is, you know, uh, are there folks that take consciousness as primary uh, and other, other aspects of you know, what we call reality derivative from that? And, uh, absolutely, that would be consistent with the worldview of many people from many, many mystical traditions. And it's actually completely consistent with the worldview of mainstream Western science, too, because really all we do have is our conscious experience. And to just give that more weight uh, in how we're then evaluating everything else that we think we've concluded by reality is a good thing to do, I believe. So absolutely, that's a very, very viable direction. Yes? Um, I don't know. If Who's aware of the neuro, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, World Fascial Research Congress? And I'm curious if there's any uh, sleep docs studying uh, with those people who study fascia. Uh, everything here has been uh, mind-body. I'm a therapist for 30 years. I'm body-mind. I'm myofascial, neuromyofascially aware. And I'm more curious about how these things relate not just to, uh, quote, unquote, a body, but how the body changes uh, with regard to the many states of different sleeps, uh, the, the hyper legs, and all those things. How does the fascia respond during these different waves of, of sleep cycle? Thank you. OK. Well, uh, that would be a really great question to maybe continue with at, uh, when we have our more global discussion. Certainly, I, uh, the, I, and I'm not an expert on you know, sort of fascia stuff, but I do know that we are organisms. You know, we, are, uh, we are bodies. And you know, I kept saying brain, 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 neuroscience, whatever. But really, the brain is an integral piece of a larger system, which is our body, including our fascia, uh, and and all of that. And it's all interconnected. Again, if there's if there's one lesson that modern science is driving home over and over and over again in deeper and deeper ways, is the vast interconnectivity of everything. So to separate out any tissue or any system in the body and say it's primary you know in this condition and this is this other stuff is secondary is probably a mistake you know and probably going to take us down a wrong path okay so uh, so uh, yeah vast interconnectivity and I and and I'm just throwing mind into this too I think that mind and consciousness are going to be part of this web of interconnectivity in profoundly interesting ways so with that a uh, good time to take a coffee break and uh, feed your mind and other ways. <laughs>